super happy to be here and to talk a little bit about uh, what, what we're doing in terms of fairness, equity, and inequality. So I'm Guillaume. Uh, it's French for William. So if you want to call me William, that's uh, completely fine. Um, and I lead the computational social science team at LinkedIn, which, which works pretty heavily um, on, on these questions of, of fairness and equity. And very happy to be talking kind of at this cross-discipline um, uh, seminar because, you know, we are looking at, at these questions really with a variety of kind of questions and tools. Of course, we're looking at our models. But we're also looking at our observational data, which is like how, how do models interact with user behavior? And of course, you know, uh, we were looking at a lot of experiments. Teams are always doing A-B tests, trying different algorithms, different things, and we're trying to learn as much as we can from these A-B tests. And, you know, the, the, the team is really varied in terms of kind of um, backgrounds. Uh, there, there's mathematicians, there's computer scientists, economists, psychologists, uh, user experience researchers. Uh, I myself have, my, I have a training in, in economics primarily, but it's really kind of a cross-discipline, um, cross-discipline and cross kind of question effort. Um, so. Um, at a high level, right? Like just just to briefly kind of plug plug my team. Uh, I'm part of um, data science applied research, which has research tracks on experimentation, time series analysis, computational social sciences, and responsible data use, and including privacy. Um, and you know we are we're very research oriented, trying to essentially build kind of next generation solutions and methodologies for for the company. And uh, we are hiring, so if there are any PhD students, uh, please reach out, please reach out to me if you're interested. Uh, it might not surprise you to know that I am reachable on LinkedIn. So you can find me you can find me on LinkedIn and and, and connect with me if if you're interested. Um, so the agenda. I'll talk a little bit about like uh, you know the LinkedIn context and the LinkedIn specificities, especially when it comes to fairness and the complexities that are involved. I'll talk a little bit about like the assessment tools that we're building, and these are you know this is completely open. These are things we're thinking about, and you know it, uh, this is kind of what what the, the research team is thinking about, and not necessarily the you know opinion of the company in, per se. And then like what we're trying to do when it comes to the monitoring impact, both things that are done with kind of equity in mind and also things that might happen kind of uh, unintentionally. Um, so, you know, the vision of the company, and this has been the case for a long time, is to create economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce. And so there, there's kind of some sort of equity statement built into the vision from the get-go, which is like, this is really for everybody. Uh, and it's not only for people with great networks, you know, the right kind of educational pedigree uh, or, you know, people from a specific demographic only. And of course, what it means, you know, for us primarily is that, is that at least conceptually, two people with equal talent should have equal access to opportunity. Right? So it's really kind of an equal opportunity framework and opportunities. Well, for us that, you know, part of them maps to actually metrics that we observe, which is are people finding jobs or are they getting hired? Uh, are they engaging with content? Can they build a network? Can they find mentors? All these things with the additional difficulty, of course, that people come to LinkedIn for a variety of purposes. So it's not like everyone comes to find a job or to build a network. People come at different times in their lives. Uh, with, with a different purpose. But the good news, at least for us, is like at least kind of these opportunities, right? A lot of them we can actually we can actually observe in our data and we can kind of kind of trying to keep track of them uh, and see, you know, if we see any sort of differences. Um, of course, you know, this is like a super tough challenge uh, and I'm really not at all going to claim that like a tiny uh, data science team can 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 somehow fix everything. Uh, and there's also a lot of investments that we're making to work also with the customers, right? So people, the companies that, that work with LinkedIn to help them address bias uh, that, that, they may, that they may be concerned about. Um, and so really the, the spirit of this talk is much more to talk about like the, the kinds of problems that we're facing and the kinds of methodologies we're, we're thinking thinking about rather than specific on than, than focusing on one kind of specific solution um, and just kind of showcase like the, the the breadth of questions that we're facing and hopefully kind of induce uh, some 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 ideation and, and some some collaboration um, so you no know, the approach that we're do, using for now is essentially so an equal opportunity approach and I'm not I'm not saying like it's the specific equal opportunity fairness metric but just kind of conceptually right like that we don't want barriers that are in the way of people we're not saying everyone should have the same outcome necessarily but at least that like people's access to opportunity doesn't vary uh, because of something that they can control uh we're trying to understand the LinkedIn specifics um you know in terms of um what matters to opportunity and surprise, surprise, like networks actually play, play a big role. Uh, and, and so differences in social capital, differences in network actually have a big impact uh, on, on, on kind of opportunities. Uh, and then kind of like create change starting with measurement. And again, this is not claiming that, that we can measure everything. It's very hard to measure, but it, it hopefully we can at least provide some input, you know, as, as data scientists into like how to think about these things and how to prioritize. 
uh, and what should we look at first? Uh, and so, you know, I'm not going to give a specific definition of fairness that would be kind of uh, the official one. This is really kind of very high level, but this idea, you know, this idea is that like we all have some sort of deep rooted sense of, of what's fair and unfair. Uh, there's some really cool YouTube videos about like, you know, children and primates reacting to all sorts of like different um, unfair treatment, uh, if you want to watch them. But really the common thread is like it's some sort of inequality of treatment or of outcomes without a accepted mechanism to justify them. And so what it means for us is like we can't really separate, right? We can't separate just the data and the, and the mechanism that actually led to what we're observing. We have to kind of consider these two things as, as holistically um, as possible. And, you know, we also have this intent versus impact kind of framework in our thinking that comes from a variety of kind of noticing a number of things, um, and, and some of this is going to echo what, what, what Kalinda actually just mentioned, which is even if our systems kind of pass some specific fairness metric and we say, oh, we're good, we have parity here or there, it's still possible that once you roll it out, you actually see like heterogeneous impact. It actually impacts different categories of members very differentially, and we want to understand that. It's also important to understand that from, from a user perspective, from a member perspective, um, there isn't like a strong divide between algorithmic bias and other kinds of bias. It's like you come to LinkedIn uh, expecting to be hired, to be able to showcase your skills, and you have either this expectation to be treated fairly or not. And you know, it's it really, whether it's the algorithm or something else in the product, uh, it, it, in some sense, from a member perspective, it's not always it's not always easy to tell apart. And we've certainly seen uh, places where, like you know, you can have differences uh, that that are far outside of algorithms, but yet significant. So um, it could just be that you come to the platform, you don't see anybody that looks like you, and so then you feel like, oh, this is probably not for me. Uh, we've seen instances where, like copywriting, wording of things can have an impact, uh, and also things as simple as like technical issues. Like different differential renderings, rendering speeds on different phones, different devices. Uh, this can all have inclusion impact, right? So what we're really thinking about this is we're thinking about this kind of holistically and not only focusing on specific uh, specific algorithms or just purely algorithmic bias. Um, this is just not to make this is not to make everyone's head spin, but this is it is a really complicated problem uh, because there's feedback loops loops everywhere and there's humans in all loops as well. So the idea is like you know we're really it matters who's represented on LinkedIn, who's on and who's off LinkedIn, who feels like they're able to join and it is for them. Then you know people have to be able to create a profile, put their data in there and feel like, okay, on the profile, I can represent myself in a way that's comfortable, in a way that's gonna make me attractive to recruiters potentially, to other people. And then what's less visible is like, we have to be able to process that data, right? Because what you write on your LinkedIn profile gets standardized, right? So you might you might write some text saying, this is my job. That's going to be standardized to figure out, okay, well, what is that job in terms of the categories that we know? Should we create a new category? So you have to be able to be understood equally well by standardization algorithms. And then from there, you're here to build a network um, that involves humans and algorithms. You're here to find a job, involves humans and algorithms, and you're here to be found uh, discoverable and be heard when you post something, also something that involves humans and algorithms. Uh, there's humans in, in a lot of the loops that we care about, and it goes a little bit beyond kind of just the biased data, so to speak. So for example, if you just take the example of like trying to recommend someone for a job, there's really two algorithms there. There's like this labor market matchmaker, which is going to make a short list of people to, can to consider, and then there's like a hiring manager. That's the algorithm that's kind of in the brain of the recruiter, so to speak, that's going to decide the higher and no higher situation. And what's what's difficult here, I guess, or what's what, what the complexity here is that it's not only that there might be biased data, is like at the end of the day, the recruiter holds the key to making the hiring decision or not. And so, you know, that that, that means that like the there, there's only so much the algorithm can do if you just have a purely algorithmic situation. Same in the case of connecting, right? Like I can recommend a, a, a connection to you, but at the end of the day, you may decide not to accept it. And so there's these always these two algorithms, the one that the recommendation we're making and then the ultimate decision of the person accepting and that that person holds the ultimate key. Uh, and so we're always thinking about both things kind of jointly, which is there might be like strict bias in the algorithm. So say systematic under predicting. So of like that, that a woman, for example, might be accepted for a job or might be accepted for a recommendation. But there may also be bias uh, from a human perspective. Like some people might just be less likely to accept. There might be bias in the product saying that like, if we don't surface the right information to a recruiter, for example, they may become more likely to rely on heuristics that we think might not be fair. Like, you know, if you if we don't show the right data to recruit it, it might be okay, well. Let me just select on pedigree, for example, right? And so our job is also to increase transparency and to make sure that like people make the have the best the best possible information. Uh, so there's all these things to consider. 
And so for this, we've built kind of a series of, um, of assessment tools. This is uh, in no way kind of a, a complete uh, representation uh, of all the tools that, that we've built, um, but essentially uh, they go in kind of several flavors. Uh, we have some tools that we're using to assess our models, kind of a training, right? Then we have some tools to actually look at like how they play um, once they are deployed. Uh, and in some sense, like, you know, what do we see in terms of the distribution of our metrics? Who's getting hired? Who's getting hired less, who's engaging with these products, who is not. And then very importantly, we also have like all these A-B testing uh, tactics to try and figure out, okay, we thought this model was good. Like, let's see, let's see what's happening in practice. Is it actually, uh, is it actually helping the categories that, um, that it means to help? And so internal toolkit essentially, um, I'll talk a little bit about this, but like a, a lot of the, a lot of the opportunities on LinkedIn actually are in the shape of a funnel in the sense that you first come to the site you first come to the site, you fill your profile, then you might look for a job, so engaging with a jobs product. Then you, know, you might reach out to someone, then that person is gonna respond to you, and then eventually there might be a hire, right? So it's hard to consider fairness or equity without really kind of taking that funnel multi-step process into consideration. We have some tools to look at like fairness of the model in, diff in, in different ways, uh, you know, using classical fairness metrics. And very importantly, I'll double click on this, we also have ways to look at like the, the representation or data um, because you know, it, it, a lot of the things that people enter in their profiles have to go through some sort of standardiz standardization stage um, before before they can actually be uh, before they can actually be processed. Um, so, for example, right, like the first thing right like, that I mentioned is like you build a profile, you come to LinkedIn. Are we able to kind of understand different get different demographics equally well in terms of what they fill into the profile? Uh, and so, there's some raw data that's put in. Uh, then you know you might be able you might declare your gender. Uh, we might also be able to to infer it from pronouns and from your first name, uh, and you might also declare some skills, some job titles, and some industries. And the issue is like you know we might need to use the inferred gender to assess potential bias in the standardization algorithms themselves. And you know the computation of kind of this bias is is influenced by all sorts of things. So the product experience, right? Like there might be a type ahead that helps you fill fill the fields in your profile uh, so that there uh, so that you know you, you you go straight into a category versus having to like enter clear text there might be potential reporting bias in gender some people might be more likely to report their 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 you know their gender than others uh, there might be bias in the inference model there might be bias in the standardization algorithms uh, there might be missingness in the taxonomy in the taxonomy so you know we're 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 linking your text entry to different categories that we know of, different skills, different jobs, different companies, different seniority levels, geos, all that stuff we might have missing. There, there, there might be bias there. And then, you know, there's always the issues of like gendered taxonomy itself, which is it could be um, that someone enters, you know, a feminine or masculine version of a job descriptions for languages like, like my language, like French, right? Where, you know, there's, you, you know, uh, each job, each job name, each job title will have like a masculine and a feminine version. Um, and so all these things may actually have an impact on how we um, uh, on the standardization bias. Um, then we look at like representation in our funnels. And so the idea is like, we always try to look at the metrics, uh, looking at the, uh, looking at uh, the funnel structure that they have. Uh, and so the idea is like, you, you go to the first step and then do we see a differential likelihood between different categories of surviving to the next step, controlling for things that we think, you know, we should, we, we should control for. So to give you an example, uh, this is like the, this is like a, a you know, from, from a, proposed algorithm, this is not the main algorithm, this is like just like a, a key, a, a test example, basically, uh, of people you may know. And so people you know, you come to the site, we propose some people that uh, we think, you know, you might want to connect to. And so we generate some candidates, then these candidates are impressed, then, you know, you, you might receive an invite or you might not, and then you might accept the invite or not. And then essentially, we look at these kind of normalized probabilities of surviving down this funnel and what we see is that like uh, females are like more likely to receive invites uh, but they're actually less likely to accept them and then the, the first question that comes up when you look at these kinds of metrics is like well it is that something that needs to be mitigated or not right or is that is that okay and i guess it really depends on whether this is a behavioral difference or this is an algorithmic difference and i'll talk about that a little bit and if, even if it is a behavioral difference it might be 
just kind of a rational reaction to expected you know, negative experiences, right? So it might be that like people are more guarded because they feel like something bad will happen if they receive, um, if, they, if they accept more invitations. And so the first thing I want to talk about with this example is like, you, we may not want to just use a hammer and say, oh, let's just, let's just do whatever we can. So we, equalized, uh, so we equalize invites that are accepted. If, it, if the difference in behavior comes from like a rational expectation that there might be bias uh, down, uh, downstream, basically. Um, you know, it's also very interesting when you start to, feel, to, 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 to ask yourself about, are people getting equal opportunity in terms of the opportunities we can measure? Is like, what, what should we control for? Like, do we only want to compare people within the same country? Do we only want to compare people within the same industry, the same job title? Do we want to com com compare people across? And you see, you can actually get very different results. So this is like another funnel. This is from sending uh, invitations. So, you know, you, you, you have impressions because you see PYMK, you send invites, and then they may get accepted or they may not get accepted. And depending on whether you, you, you compare people within similar network sizes or not, you get a very different result in terms of differences between men and women. And so the question is like, should we, norm, should, should, if, if we say we control for the network, then we don't see any huge differences. If we don't control for the network, then we see differences. And so this is something that you know, we have to do for each kind of like assessment, just decide, okay, we want to compare apples to apples, but kind of what are the what are the things what are the apples here what do we want to compare um and we also have um a an open sourced uh fairness toolkit which is which is on github uh which allows you to essentially get get a you know for for different models that you want to train and in a way that's very very scalable get a series of fairness metrics uh and and, and potentially some some mitigation strategies and what's really great about this is like it scales very very well um i want to spend the last and so, so this is kind of on the on the assessment side. And again, this is a description of kind of the problem space that we're facing, uh, not emphasizing on a particular solution. Um, and I also want to talk a little bit about what we do for impact monitoring, which is like when something is rolled out, what do we do, right? And so the, the very minimal thing that we can do, like when, once there's a new say algorithm that's rolled out, is to do some sort of a some sort of an outcome test. So the idea is like we have this algorithm, it gives people scores, right? And these scores are used everywhere. So they're, they're used to be mixed into all sorts of different rankings uh, and different screens. And we can ask, okay, between men and women who we gave the same score to, do we actually see them realize similar outcomes downstream? Or do we see that there's a systematic kind of difference? This is different from calibration in the sense that we, we, we really don't just do this on the training set, on, like on the training set, we actually try to do this online, which is, okay, this is how we've treated you because this is a score we gave you. And the score we gave you essentially determined your position Pretty much everywhere. Do we see your realized equal outcomes or not? Um, yeah, this is, three minutes. I'm sorry. We have three minutes. Yes, that is perfect. Um, and 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 so we can essentially have these plots that try and look at like for for score quantiles. Do we see systematic differences between predicted uh, and accepted um, downstream out outcomes? And that's the first thing we can do. The second, we roll something. The other thing is like we actually also do a lot of A/B testing um, to try and look at like every experiment's impact on different opportunities uh, by category, so this may be by demographics, by network size and social capital, and also on the concentration of metrics. And this goes far beyond just algorithmic interventions, but just all sorts of interventions. Right? Do we see that this algorithm is somehow increasing, changing the distribution of opportunities across categories and also within categories? Do we see concentration or not? And you know that, that turns out to be important because uh, a, an, uh, an unintended consequence of potentially trying to balance two groups is to like create some imbalance inside a particular group. Um, and so one thing we've been doing for a couple of years, which has been pretty informative for product launches, is actually to look at concentration indices for every new product launch. And so the, the simple intuition here is, you know, imagine that like you have 10 members and they each have one session. Uh, you know, if I tell you, hey, I have this AB, I have this new experiment, it's going to double the number of sessions. It can happen that like the sessions have doubled for everybody. We can happen that this, it can happen that the sessions have doubled for I have more than doubled for a small number of people. Concentration has increased tremendously, but the average impact is the same. So we always flag these kinds of impacts to the product team when they happen and try to learn why, what kinds of products seem to increase concentration. Um, I'll skip over the details in the interest of time. But one thing that was very interesting that we captured um, is uh, you know, this kind of this new algorithm that we launched a couple of years ago, which was about like um, new, um, new job notifications. So when a job is posted, instead of having to hear about it through your network or find it on your feed, we just send you instantly a notification saying, hey, we think you should apply for this job. What we saw is like this actually really decreased the concentration of job applications. Instead of, 
you know, if, instead of being very concentrated on a small number of people, they were deconcentrated. So you can think of like as changing the Gini coefficient, for example. Uh, and we also saw, when looking at the categorical impact, that the, the, the strongest impact was on people with low social capital. So people who benefited the most from an algorithmic intervention was actually people who did not have the great social capital. So this is a hopeful message that algorithms can actually substitute for these broken human heuristics. And so our goal is to learn from these experiments and try and figure out you know what's happening and how can we um, how can we replicate these learnings um yeah and just just to finish the high level findings that we have on this is really we should be very careful with quote unquote business neutral experiments because even if they're neutral on average there's often either inequality in terms of concentration uh, impact that's hiding or categorical impact and we should be very mindful also of things that seem you know purely technical like device speed the, how the rendering is done and things like that, because those often have like very strong inclusion impact, even though they're not, you know, quote unquote, like about algorithmic fairness. And all these things are, are on GitHub, uh, you know, they're open source. So uh, feel free to take a look if you're interested. Uh, just acknowledge all of my colleagues who've contributed to this and happy to take any, any questions. That was amazing. Thank you, Guillaume, and thank you, everyone. I think we do have a couple of minutes, Guillaume, and People posted some questions in the chat. Do you want to just scroll through them and address a couple of them? I saw Andy had a couple of questions. Um, Let me see here. Are these? Yeah. So is the so the the yeah the the LinkedIn Spanish toolkit. It is it is on GitHub. Yeah. Um, it's called Lift L I F T. It's already it's already available. And so is the so is the the inequality toolkit. Uh, they should both be on on GitHub. I I, I can share the links. I, I have them on my on my slide deck. Um, Okay, so um, looking at the the other questions here, um, where is it consideration of age, ageism and ableism? So this is something that uh, you know the the company cares about. So as part of kind of the the user experience research that we do, these are these are things that we do we do care about. So this is something that you know is definitely something that would be that would be in scope, right? Um, how do you account for uh, information of the funnel that happens outside of your ability to capture? Yeah, so that's a really good one, right? And 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 generally speaking, it's not just like there's also a lot of stuff that's hap that has to do with people's um, motivation and people's kind of intent on the platform, which is why you know we're always trying to look at this from an equal opportunity and not so much like equal outcome because we know people might be coming for diff for for different reasons, right? But we can try to test some of these things, right? So, the, for example, if someone doesn't accept an invite just because they they don't want to, that might have different testable implications. If someone doesn't accept an invite because they know if they do something bad's going to happen, right? And so then you can try to look at experiments that have changed, for example, you know, abuse protection, things like this, and try to try to tell those two things apart. But generally speaking, we're very mindful that despite having a lot of data, there's most things we don't know, because most things are actually in people's head. What, are, what kind of information the recruiter has when they're making their decision? Likely that recruiters know things we don't, and what, what information has a person has when they accept, um, when they accept a connection. Um, Social cap so I guess uh, social capital quantif uh, quantification. Uh, yeah, they, they, I, I'm happy to I'm happy to share. Uh, this is actually something I've worked on with with, with Yavor here. Um, but essentially, the, the 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 main thing that we found to have like a strong impact uh, on careers it, it has to do with like network structure. And so we primarily quantify uh, social capital on network structure. And again, like you, here we just categorize it and say, well, there's some people. With really great looking networks and some people with like weaker networks, do we see an, a heterogeneity in the impact of what we're doing uh, in terms of these uh, network structures? Um, all right. Yeah. I think, Jim, thank you so much for answering all those questions. Uh, and thank you for all of our speakers. This was absolutely fascinating. I know I learned a ton.